Thank you for tuning in to our part one episode of the COVID-19 Effect on Nonprofit Fundraising and Events series. My name is Lena Parks, Senior Manager at Barnes Wendling, and I will be moderating this episode again. In part one, we discussed the overall COVID-19 impact on fu fundraising efforts. And in part two, we'll discuss the overall impact on fundraising events. Here to join us again are Barnes Wendling Nonprofit Director, Lori Gatton, Director of Development and Communications at the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Melanie Shakarian, the Director of Corporate Relations at the Salvation Army of Greater Cleveland, Carol Skogland. All right, let's get started. We know each of you have large events that you host annually. Can you describe what the event usually looks like and explain the changes made in 2020 to continue the excitement for attendees and keep them engaged as well as encourage donations? So I'm going to start with Carol on this one. Thanks, Lena. The Salvation Army in the recent years has held a uh, annual civic luncheon in the fall, which has been a, a significant fundraiser for us. Um, typically, we would um, gross about 200000 half of that through corporate sponsorships, um, the, the remaining through um, gifts, ticket sales, um, you know, gifts made in the room. And we would typically have about 300 uh, of our, our, our donors attend. Um, and uh, it is a chance to create that sense of community, bring everyone together, share our story. and. Um, so that's, uh, that, was, um, that was what we had to postpone during the pandemic. Um, the shift we moved to was to take a program virtually or to get our story out there through two uh, virtual forums we hosted with the help of the City Club. Um, again, stepping into new technology or formats, um, it's like, well, call in, call in the pros or others that can help, help uh, support you. So. Um, we, we held to create that sense of community, two virtual forums with, with panelists. And I can say you know, one was held in July and one in September. Attendance you know, was about 40, 50 individuals at each respectively. And, um, and the fundraising, you know, it wasn't replacing. It wasn't replacing what we were doing at the luncheon. But I think what it did serve is still trying to create a sense of community to come together. And in terms of the maintaining some corporate sponsorship opportunities, it was an event, a, a virtual event that allowed um, some, some opportunity for giving by the corporate um, world. And um, so, so it, you know, it, it, it's not always easy to take something into a virtual format. Melanie, what about at the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland? How did how did you uh, keep your donors engaged in this process, and what changed? Sure. Um, so we host two major events a year: um, Jam for Justice, which is our lower ticket price sort of fun summer event, and then our annual meeting, which is uh, late in the fall every year which as the name suggests is our annual meeting and luncheon. Um, and both events uh, typically get a thousand people to attend each. And so um, over time, they didn't start out at having a thousand people attending each, right? They've grown over time and, and in some ways have become this irreplaceable uh, uh, line item uh, for our fundraising. And so um but one reason why they um, also grew into such significant events is we got creative a few years ago and marketed our corporate sponsorships uh, for these events as a year long sponsorship to legal aid. So it was an all in uh, support us with this one sponsorship and you get the benefit of the publicity and the kudos with both events. And so we do a lot of work to secure most of those sponsorships in January and February of every year. So when COVID hit, we were in this really unusual situation where we had commitments and almost full payments from all sponsors for these events that uh, we had planned to have in person. Um, as 2020 continued on. So I think because of that, we had this sense of obligation um, to fulfill out our promise to those sponsors to give them uh, an experience that gave them pride in their support for legal aid, gave them the exposure they were expecting. 
And so um, I think that incentivize us to really think creatively. And so both events moved to a virtual platform. Uh, we still were able to use the stage at the House of Blues and uh, create a virtual experience for Jam for Justice. And then also um, worked with a production company uh, to do a live stream annual event. But then uh, what changed dramatically for us is how we promoted around that, right? Um, we made sure and, and, and can quantify for all of our supporters how much we gave them exposure on social media, the number of posts, the number of tweets um, where they got tagged. Uh, we made sure to um, honor that support um, as we continued through the year. Uh, but most importantly, having the conversation with the, the sponsors, letting them know um, this is how we're doing it this year. This is where the funds are going to and what they're benefiting um, and, uh, and making sure they would, would, would be on board with that. And, and every one of them continued the commitment. And because we had a different um, level of overhead, we actually netted more <laughs> from both events than we have in the past. And Melanie, Melanie, to add on to that, you still sold tickets for your for your events. Uh, um, which, how do you still sell tickets for an event that you're not attending in person? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had these fun tickets printed up by House of Blues, like a Ticketmaster ticket to you know uh, as a COVID souvenir for a virtual event which were an amazing hit with people. The other interesting thing is typically when we have an in-person event, um, you know, the attendees are, they're working at, uh, in the terminal tower across the street and they walk over after work to attend this event. What was really fascinating about our events this year is, you know, one of the band members uh, in one of the Jam for Justice bands had a cousin who lived in New York who always wanted to come, but never did but he bought a ticket for this virtual event because <laughs> he felt like he could then be included, right? Which was something we never could have offered the cousin in New York in the past. So um, we had a lot of out-of-state quote-unquote attendees, which was interesting. Um, and, and a lot of people who typically the in-person event maybe just isn't for them, but they enjoyed watching it from home. We teamed up with Cleveland in a Box. So those who did buy this ticket got a little fun package of goodies. Um, it, it didn't cost us nearly as much as if we had uh, drinks and food in person. So it was, um, it made sense to do that, to have a little fun. And then there were people tweeting about the box that they got and the, the fun ticket they got for the event. So yeah, we still did sell tickets and, and people felt like they were getting something out of the experience for sure. Wonderful. Lori, you have attended a couple of virtual fundraising events. Can you describe the experience as an attendee? Yes. Yeah, so I went to what would have been an annual gala um, for a board that I'm part of. And, you know, it was weird. Uh, at first, I, I was expecting it to be weird because it, I'd never done that before. And it was in the fall. So it was still Zoom was still somewhat newish, and especially for events. Um, I did enjoy being comfortable, so that was a nice thing as an attendee, right? I I, I um, didn't have to get all dressed up, but I, I so I, from that point of view, it was comfortable. Um, but I did, as Melanie mentioned, I, I bought a ticket. So in my mind, um, even though we weren't receiving the the nice dinner and the drinks and all of that, um, and may, maybe this is just the world I live in, but it was always my expectation to spend the same amount of money I would always spend at the gala, regardless of whether I was receiving anything, because that, that really isn't why I attend. And it, it, it's nice, but it's not why I'm there. So, and I do think most people have that mentality is if they're going to support an organization, they're going to support the organization. But I do get the, the kind of the hesitancy on an organization's part you know, because there's always that return of, well, what am I really buying? It's like, well, you're, you're not really buying anything. <laughs> you're supporting the organization. So, um, but they did it, it. I think it was very well done. Um, it was shorter for sure. Uh, Pre-recorded videos on programs and activities that uh, kind of an update that things that 
you know, and that, and that usually was at the gala too. They had things that would run on the video, but um, in addition, there was the, the MC that was on site and um, as well as other members of the organization were on site. So you were watching them present. And then there was an online raffle. So we had raffle tickets that we bought and then they, they pulled the raffle. And so we were watching that and, um, and they had different things that you would watch while the raffle was going on. So you're not just sitting there staring at somebody pulling a ticket out of a, so they did well with that and keeping you um, active and engaged in the event. Um, and then at the part of the gala that you always have where you just kind of raise your paddle type thing and you're just, you're going through, uh, uh, you know, who wants to give this much? Uh, they even pulled that off as well. So, um, you know, they would, they would list the names of <clears throat> people giving uh, significant amounts of money on screen and, and people were chatting, the chat was open. And so you, you could see people's chat uh, so it, it was different, and I think it was successful. Uh, they ra they raised more money than they had before. It was more profitable for sure because the cost wasn't there, and I, they reached so many more people for this organization because uh, their constituency are can be cross country. So it was a way for them to participate and see it all happening, um, which was nice. So I and I think like going forward, it was more of a well, we can do this. Um, so maybe it's a nice break of you have the gala and then maybe you do the online format. So it's sort of maybe an alternative every other year or every so many years. So it's not just always the annual gala the way it always is. So it's just another opportunity to put something in there differently. That actually leads me to the next question I have for both Carol and Melanie. Um, in the future, when we can foresee past COVID-19 and, and hopefully we re our lives go back to normal in terms of socially being able to gather, do you foresee continuing to offer virtual events? Uh, let's, uh, we'll start with Carol. I'd like to, to, to put it this way, respond this way. We will continue with virtual options and it, it, it's, it's not necessarily an either or, but we've got we've to continue um, with the virtual options. Um, even most recently, just last week, um, we're starting up a young professionals chapter in Cleveland for the Salvation Army, which we which we call Echelon. And so this group of young professionals on the steering committee hosted a networking event down at the chocolate bar last week. And it was a hybrid networking event. So we live streamed it. And for those that wanted to 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 stay, you know, remotely um, just for concerns with the pandemic still, we gave them that option. There were many that chose to go down in person. That was a first, you know, trying something like that. Will that continue that kind of thinking? Absolutely. Um, and the other thing I want to share as, 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 as something that really caught my attention at a um, uh, webinar I was on recently, and one of the panelists said this, the definition of an event has changed. Um, it's no longer a point in time. It's a launch of a movement. And Melanie said um, in, in the earlier episode, the fundraising strategy goes hand in hand with our communications plan and telling our story. I found it interesting where he elaborated on this point that an event, don't think of it any about returning to that point in time event. It's the launch of a movement, what happens afterwards. And what he went on to say is think about the content, how you're telling your story, the video content in particular, um, and how you're repurposing that, putting it on demand, and engaging your intended audience following the event. And when I heard this, it was happening right around the presidential inauguration, an event. And think about Amanda Gorman, who was the Poet Laureate, and think what happened, that movement that happened after that point in time, how her her poem that she delivered just took off in social media and around the world and the kind of engagement that created. I think that helps us to think a little differently of how we continue to work in this environment to fundraise and get our story out there. Thank you. Melanie, what, what do you have to add to this? Uh, will, will you, do you foresee continuing virtual? Yeah, I think um, in, a, in a few different ways, you know, um, <laughs> we're recording this actually on a very snowy day in, in February. 
And um, I think Carol would agree with me as, as we've planned in-person events in the past uh, in Cleveland, if you were planning, for instance, a breakfast event, you would avoid January, February, and March because you'd be worried about sort of that contingency plan of what if it snows, right? Um, and interestingly, uh, while not a fundraising event, uh, we're planning a public officials reception, which in the past would have been in person, and now we're planning it on Zoom. And I think we're going to see, um, in some ways, better attendance because you know our our service area covers five counties in Northeast Ohio. And if we're going to plan this event for you know you know March or April, and uh, we have some of our elected officials who are you know traveling from Columbus or coming from Ashtabula County or Lorraine. We could just think differently about how to reach people. And as Carol just mentioned, I think you you have this point in time that you're launching uh, a communications effort, a movement, and then use that as your launching pad. And it can be virtual. It can be in person. You can think creatively now about it. And I think the last year has opened our minds to what those possibilities are. And, um, and the good thing is because we've all experienced this together, um, we, we all know that people now can log in on Zoom or some type of a, a virtual platform and you can figure out a way to, to get people to engage. So Wonderful. Now, as we wrap up this two-part series, I would love for you to briefly just give me one takeaway, either professionally or personally, um, that you, you took out of 2020. Uh, so I, I will start with, we'll stick with you, Melanie. Well, uh, it's possible to ask for a major gift on Zoom and not shake a donor's hand, which I have found uh, really jarring, but um, interesting how we've all been able to adapt so quickly. Um, and so I think there, um, I think there's going to be lots of new and different ways to engage our supporter community. And it's not, it's not going to be, you know, taking people out to breakfast, lunch, or dinner as much anymore. I think we're going to find new ways. Um, and I think it'll be ways that we can reach more people too. Um, you can have coffee over zoom for 15 or 20 minutes and, uh, uh, and, and, and meet with a whole variety of people from a, a larger area uh, that you serve um, and engage more people in the really important work of, of, of your mission. Wonderful. Carol? And I'll just add, be flexible and continue to adapt. That's how we're going to be successful. Keep looking forward. Let us not try to be going back to something. Keep going forward. Just do it. And it's so rewarding. Whether or not the results are exactly what you had hoped for, you're pushing it. I would just uh, echo the same things Carol and Melanie had said. I um, I do think, you know, there are a lot of, of bad that happened with the pandemic and we'll continue to see the fallout with that. But there is a lot of good. Um, and I think it's caused a lot of change that historic change that, you know, our kids will, will their kids will read in history, history books and say, oh, remember when this happened and, and we'll be sitting in the rocking chair like, yes, and, and, and we had to go on Zoom and we had to do all these, these technological advances and, right, so these are good things and, and I, think, I think if you keep that mindset and, and, and you do move forward, I, I think you can create new possibilities that you didn't even know were there um, and, and you're making your fundraising efforts even stronger. Thank you. Thank you again to Lori, Melanie, and Carol for joining us in this podcast series. This episode, along with other podcast episodes, are housed on our website at barneswendling.com backslash insights.